Can I get everybody to please take their seats? Good evening and welcome to our candidates response session. Uh, before I start, I wanted to find out if we have a candidate from the Liberal Party in the audience. And if you are here, could you come to the stage, please? What? Okay, we'll start. That's okay. I'm Al Hashem, I'm Chair of the Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce and owner of Maximum Express Courier, Max Furniture, and Cambria College. I'll be the moderator this evening on behalf of the City of Victoria, Tourism Victoria, the Greater Victoria Harbour Authority, the Downtown Victoria Business Association, and the Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce. These five organizations have been working together on issues important to our city and region for many months. And we decided to work together during the provincial election campaign to raise the profile of issues that require action from the provincial government. Many of you were here for our candidates' listening session on March 2nd. At that event, Mayor Lisa Helps and the CEOs of the other organizations presented this important issue to the provincial candidates in attendance and made specific requests for action by the provincial government. The six issues are increase affordable housing, improve mental health and addiction services, create a regional transportation commission, complete Belleville terminal improvements, Develop Ogden Point and establish Homeport Victoria and complete sewage treatment. We intentionally made our request before the election platforms of each party had been published so parties would have time to respond. Now we're going to give each party the opportunity to share their responses with us tonight. We asked each party which sits in the legislature to designate a spokesperson. I'm joined on stage by NDP Carol James. <laughs> Green Party, Callan Harris. <laughs> and nobody from the Liberal Party yet, so if they do show up. <laughs> I'd like to describe the format for tonight. Each of our six issues will be briefly summarized by the person who presented it at the March 2nd listening session. The presenter will repeat the request we made for the provincial government's action. Each party representative will have two minutes to respond. Then we will move on to our next issue. All speakers should watch the light and wrap up when the comments when they see the yellow light. At the end of the six issues, there will be 20 minutes for questions and answers from the audience. Then we will give each candidate in attendance the opportunity to address the audience for one minute. And if all goes as planned, we will conclude the session at 7 p.m. So our first issue is increasing affordable housing presented by Mayor Lisa Helps. <laughs> Mayor Helps, you have two minutes. Thank you very much. Start the clock. I want to uh, begin by acknowledging that we're gathered on the traditional territories of the Songhees and Esquimalt nations uh, and also to acknowledge that 2017 is a year of reconciliation in Victoria. So I'm just going to recap uh, what we said uh, on March the 2nd. I'm not going to outline the problem, we're all very aware of it, but what we are asking, and by we, uh, all these five organizations, what we are asking the province to do is, one, work with the federal government to ensure the national housing strategy and the budget allocations that accompany it 
has enough flexibility to meet local need. Number two, make predictable, consistent investment in affordable housing. Predictable, consistent, yearly investment in affordable housing. Uh, number three, reward local governments that have clear strategies at the local level for cutting red tape on a business case, sorry, cutting red tape uh, and making it easier for nonprofit and for profit housing providers to provide housing. Uh, number four, raise income assistance rates. Uh, and number five, create through tax relief, grant funding, or other innovative financing more opportunities for first time home buyers to enter the housing or condo market. So, uh, in my, before I wrap up, I guess my, that's what we want. My question to both of you uh, is what concrete things will your party do to address these issues? Thanks, Al. Thank you very much. Well, we'll start uh, two minutes with uh, NDP Carol. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you for the question, and thank you for the uh, importance of this issue. This is probably the key issue. It's certainly in our community of Victoria, but I believe across the region and across the province. We have committed to a comprehensive 10-year housing plan, uh, and that's a critical point uh, because piecemeal doesn't work. Uh, we need to make sure it's a long-term commitment, 114,000 units. Uh, we developed that number with the BC Rental Housing um, Association and the BC Co-op Housing Association. That's the number that they believe is necessary for us to be able to deal with the backlog and housing that's needed. We will increase income assistance rates by 100 a month for both people on income assistance and people on disabilities and increase earnings exemption by $200. That's again a start while we develop a poverty reduction plan which will include the comprehensive approach. Um, on the housing build, uh, we are looking at everything from rental housing to co-op housing to seniors housing, uh, land banks where the land stays in the public hands and we uh, just utilize the housing on the land because that provides opportunities for individuals. And on the issue of home ownership, one of the keys that I hear over and over again from individuals is that there is no ability for mobility in the system right now. People can't move. If they get a place because of the vacancy rate, no one moves from the place that they're in. And to truly have a, a comprehensive housing approach, you have to make sure you have mobility. So that will include rental housing, as I mentioned, co-op, and a chance for people to be able to grow into housing and home ownership in the long run. Uh, we also have a, a foreign buyer's tax for people who don't pay income tax in British Columbia. They will get a property tax each year. Uh, and the idea of incentives uh, will be clear because if municipalities are ready to go, they'll be first in line for the housing. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. And now we have two minutes for the Green Party to come. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you all for attending. Um, it feels a little bit last minute, uh, but uh, it has been a long time coming. This is, uh, this is, a, is a very uh, important topic. Um, and it's, uh, we've, we and the BC Greens have taken it very seriously. Um, we have, uh, in a number of occasions uh, in our platform, we've talked about how we will work with federal government funding to uh, make life in general more affordable for British Columbians, whether that's early childhood education or, uh, in this case, uh, affordable housing. Uh, the BC Greens have committed $750,000 a year every year for the next four years to uh, ensure that we have that predictable, consistent investment in affordable housing. Um, the rewarding local governments one is an interesting one. I, um, I, I don't know that we've brought it up in our platform, and unfortunately, I don't have an answer for that, but I think it's important that uh, it is brought up, and I would like to continue that, that, that discussion going forward. Um, raising the rates, uh, we've said that over and over and over again, and thankfully the BC Greens have decided that uh, um, to answer that call, and uh, we will raise over the course of four years the rates for people with disabilities, people on income assistance, and people uh, with, uh, that need a shelter allowance by 50%. Um, we want to make sure that people can live uh, with dignity in this province. Um, and uh, as far as uh, creating through tax relief, uh, the grant funding and other innovative financing, um, I don't know, I think we need to address uh, housing a, a bit differently. I think uh, in the BC Green platform we've talked about how we are going to invest in student housing to alleviate the rental market, make sure that there are other options for people. Um, we are going to, um, oh yeah, we're going to uh, cap the, uh, the, 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 the home buyers, uh, or the foreign, the foreign buyers tax um, at 30% uh, to make sure that we don't commodify uh, 
housing the way that we have and make uh, all houses a little bit more affordable for British clients. Thank you. Just in time. Our second issue is increasing, increasing mental health and addiction services presented by Carrie Melton of the Downtown Victoria Business Association. Carrie, you've got two minutes. Thanks, Al. Uh, so, to go sort of with affordable housing is our, our issues with homelessness, which everybody is seeing more and more lately. Um, the city of Victoria has a disproportionately higher population of homeless compared to other BC municipalities as well as the greater Victoria municipalities in our area. We are dealing with a large portion of these people with an 80,000 tax base of residents. And so we're dealing with the, the, the majority of all of these issues. So our ask to the province is how to provide supportive services for these individuals throughout the province so Victoria is no longer the draw for these services. How to adequately fund mental health and addictions care and to enhance the Island Health Authority's ability to build and properly resource the integrated teams and most importantly the outreach teams to these individuals that need help out on the streets and effectively find treatment for them. How to take the lead in assessing clients for placement into the housing managed for not-for-profits and other independent service providers so they can create the necessary treatments and harm reduction programs that then dovetail into the housing model so they can go from phase one to phase two as their needs change and as they come through the addictions processes. And improve the governance at the cabinet level by establishing a mental health secretariat as described by the 2016 Justice Summit and how to make these things workable for the people on the streets that need to have them. Thank you, Carrie. We'll start the two minutes with Callum from the Green Party. Well, um, thank you for the question. Um, mental health is, uh, is something that um, I've made a bit of a pet project from, uh, from, um, of mine uh, since I've dealt with my own mental health issues. I grew up, uh, I'm, a, I'm a product of a broken home like I think most people are these days. Um, but I dealt with depression uh, through much of my youth and, um, and having a partner who's helped me through that. Um, it has made me aware of how um, devastating mental health issues can be for, uh, for people of all backgrounds and all, uh, and all walks of life. And uh, the BC Greens have recognized the, the fact that uh, mental health issues uh, affect uh, us all. And uh, we are doing exactly what you've asked. Uh, we are we're going to establish a ministry of uh, mental health and addictions to make sure that there's uh, responsibility and accountability and a proper amount of funding uh, to uh, addressing the issue that will ultimately uh, it translates to early childhood education uh, and investment in mental health care for, uh, for students. Um, and uh, building resilience into our populations. Um, we're uh, part of the, um, that $750 million a year, uh, every year for affordable housing is also going to be a, a part of the supportive side of the housing uh, aspect uh, to make sure that uh, when people reach out for services that they get them. And, um, I would like to see personally, and I don't know that we've actually addressed it in the Green Platform, but I'd, I'd like to see uh, a unified service model so that wherever um, any one of uh, people who need help uh, reach out to get help, that they get it and then they are stewarded through the system. Um, you know, uh, I think uh, the NDP have talked about uh, ask, uh, ask for help once and get it fast, and I think um, that is a, it should be the very bare minimum that we do as a, as a, as a community uh, for people. Um, we can we look at uh, I don't have enough time, but I'd love to continue talking about more. Thank you, Colin. Thank you for staying in time. <laughs> Two minutes for NDP Carol. Thank you very much. Um, well, the fact is we don't have a mental health and addiction system right now in British Columbia. We have a piecemeal approach. Bits and pieces of service that if you're fortunate enough to be able to connect with, you're able to get services and supports. Otherwise, you're put on a wait list. Um, you have a long wait to be able to, to access any kind of services and support. So that is the first piece. Uh, committed to a minister of mental health and addictions. I, I appreciate the secretariat approach, but I believe when you have a crisis, you need to deal with that crisis. And the way to deal with that is to have a minister in place who will be ultimately responsible and accountable for how the dollars are being spent. We have new money coming from the federal government in this area as well. Uh, and we need to have a sole person responsible uh, for the spending of those dollars. 
Um, Kayla mentioned our, our approach, which the Canadian Mental Health Association is certainly uh, advocating for as well, uh, which is that an individual should not have to go to 12 different agencies to try and get support. The system should make sure that they take that individual and ensure that they get the support they need. So the file should be followed by the system, not by the individual who's struggling with mental health and addictions. We also need to put in place more recovery beds, and we need to license those beds. So we are committed to licensing the existing recovery beds so there's accountability for the individuals in the system. We need to provide supports for people. Right now, if you come out of detox, as you said, uh, often you're put back in the same situation that you were in, without the supports to be able to manage, to deal with the issues, to get the counseling that you need to actually deal with the underlying issues uh, that are there. Um, we need to stop using the most expensive methods of dealing with mental health, which is our court system and our justice system. Um, right now we are spending buckets of money in that area which doesn't provide good quality care for the individuals and is not a good use of court time. It's the wrong direction. Let's put the money into supports. So let's make sure we're providing that support. It'll address the issues you're talking about as well. Thank you, Sarah. Third is Catherine Bolt from the Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce on the need to create a regional transportation commission. Two minutes, I said, Catherine. Thanks, Al. And thanks, candidates, for being here. Uh, so traffic affects everybody in this region these days, every business, every individual, and it's not a happy situation. Um, also, not going to fix itself. Right now, uh, local governments each do their best within their respective boundaries. Uh, many innovative uh, approaches to try to introduce modes. We've got the bike lanes, for example, just opening this week. There's a lot of different things being tried, but nobody has the responsibility for the region. And transportation, in its very essence, is a regional issue. We have one successful regional service, which is the bus run by the Victoria Regional Transit Commission, and it is a, a very good test case or, or illustration of what has to be done in order to run a regional transportation system, which is that you need the right kind of governance, you need the right kind of funding, mandate, decision-making authority, expertise, you need the whole package at that level with the ability to run a regional system. I mean, God save us if we had a bus system for every one of our local governments. Um, so, if we had that same approach that we have successfully used for uh, bus in the region and applied it to all other air areas of transportation, roads, bridges, parking, bikes and walking, uh, uh, pathways and um, systems, private and public transit, any new mode of transportation, and also had the ability for a long view on transportation. Nobody at the moment can set any kind of overall objectives for reducing emissions or increasing ridership um, on alternative modes of, um, of public transit or incentivizing modes other than the car, reducing travel times, any of those bigger goals. So we have two requests in the last 13 seconds. Ah, okay, so the first one is two cents a liter gas tax to expand the bus service. We had all the local governments lined up. We made the request to government. It was supposed to be in the budget. It wasn't in the budget. I'm going to go a little bit longer out because we don't have a liberal here, okay? So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's number one. Number two, a bus lane from the West Shore between downtown and the West Shore. So we just had the tragedy of the Langtoria Green Line going down. It was a fantastic idea, but that bus was stuck in traffic. Until the bus goes faster than traffic, we're not going to get anybody else on the bus. We need a bus lane, and that's on the provincial highway. And then we need the transformational change of a transportation commission legislated by the provincial government with the right kind of um, governance of funding and responsibilities. Okay, there you go. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> We'll start with Carol. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Catherine. I think you took away some of the speaking uh, approaches that we'll be using on this issue. Uh, I think there's a, a theme for tonight, and it's no surprise that it comes from, from business organizations and others who have to do business across the region, and that's comprehensive. 
um, that we can't keep piecemealing approaches, and I think we see it with transportation uh, as well. Um, so yes to a regional transportation uh, uh, strategy, and what that authority looks like is a conversation we need to sit down and have. I think there have been genuine concerns raised about TransLink and some of the issues that happened around the governance of TransLink and the, the taxation and the lack of support for funding for TransLink. That's the Vancouver uh, Authority. And so I think we can learn from those mistakes and bring together the mayors and bring together the CRD and others who have regional structures to look at what we can build on, what, what we can improve on, and what we can get done. Um, I think the bus lanes need to happen now. Uh, we have them. I have a piece of there. There's no reason why we can't be doing now on the bus lanes um, and getting those in place. There's no reason why we can't be using the ENM track uh, from the West Shore down into Victoria, which again is a very specific strategy that could be funded. We've done studies, many of them, um, over the time. That's a piece that needs to be addressed. So I think there are short-term pieces that could be moved on now that would be good guides for our regional transportation strategy uh, and then longer term have that conversation with timelines around what the regional structure would look like, where the resources would come from. And unlike the, the BC Liberals, no referendum on transportation. Transportation is a basic service. It shouldn't be subject to referendum. The funding should come from the provincial government. Uh, we know that there's partnerships there. We've committed to 40% funding on transit uh, rather than the 33 that the current government had committed to and we think we need to get it done. Thank you. Thank you. Two minutes. Turns out Carol's been paying a lot of attention. Um, yeah, I mean, she's, uh, she's uh, elaborated a number of, uh, of really good points. I think uh, absolutely looking at, uh, and actually the BC region and I Really spent some time thinking about uh, the regional approach to this. Um, we need to think holistically about how we move people and services. Because it's not about cars, it's not about buses, it's not about trains. It's actually, it really does come down to the importance and the primacy of moving goods, services, and people around. Um, and, and as far as getting it done, as far as uh, actually developing a regional network, as far as uh, establishing a, uh, a regional uh, transit uh, authority, and I I am absolutely supportive of it, and when this came up um, the last time, I was quite surprised that uh, there had been zero movement on it. Uh, it seemed such such a commonsensical uh, thing, given the fact the the interconnectedness of the CRD, um, and uh, that actually kind of goes to another side of things: is that uh, we haven't really pushed forward on an amalgamation uh, of municipalities, which of course might actually speed up uh, the political will. Might, might inspire some of uh, some of the bureaucrats to actually get working on this. Um, but yeah, I agree. Uh, we need to look at all modes of transportation, whether it be rail. Um, our BC Liberal friends like to talk about good family producing jobs in the oil and gas industry. Well, I like uh, good family supporting jobs in the transportation development industry. Uh, laying rail, uh, electric, electrified rail, uh, and all of those types of, uh, of options that keep our people here in town and working with their families. Right? Um, <clears throat> there's, uh, there's also the fact that we have to consider that uh, the, the uh, insurance industry is likely going to uh, make it impossible for us to drive cars soon with all the self-driving cars coming around. So again, there's all sorts of tremendous uh, array of, uh, of issues that are facing us, um, and uh, we, I think we all need to work together in order to, to find solutions. Thank you, Tom. Next is Paul Nursey of, the, of Tourism Victoria on the importance of completing double terminal improvements. Paul, two minutes. Thank you, Alan. Thank you to both candidates for being here tonight. It's great to see both of you. Um, this is a file that is constantly moving, uh, including during the election campaign, uh, which is great because there's really supposed to be no action, but things are going to keep, keep moving forward. And, um, the Bevel Terminal is in Victoria's Inner Harbour. It's a key international gateway. Um, it's absolutely iconic to um, our whole region and is Canada's westernmost uh, um, entrance to not only people but goods. Um, there, after a, a long history, there's actually been some movement on it in the last number of years. Phase, there's a logical three-phase approach which um, all parties kind of get behind, only political parties, but stakeholders. Uh, repairing the docks, working on the public realm along the um, uh, the streetscape, and then the third is the terminal itself. Uh, phase one has been funded and is largely underway, in fact, nearly complete. 
Uh, phase two is a partnership between the City of Victoria and our organization, Tourism of Victoria. And I'd like to give a shout out to the hotel community who voluntarily agreed to ship that in with hotel tax when they're facing new threats and new competition, um, which shows how important that, that is. And uh, the third phase would be an ask from the federal government in partnership. So really, what we're asking the parties to consider and contemplate is to keep the momentum going. You know, we're very, very diligently on phase three uh, because that is the type of, you know, high yield experiential tourism from, from a very lucrative source market of Seattle that can help keep, you know, good local jobs here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, and thanks, Paul, uh, for your passion on this issue. Uh, we've had many conversations about the excitement of, uh, of getting it done. Um, I just hope it doesn't take, if the current government was in place another 16 years, to be able to get the next phase done. Um, but I'm optimistic. We certainly have a capital plan uh, that is in place. Uh, that will be there for the third, third, third partnership. I think it's an ideal time with the federal government putting resources in uh, to be able to look at not only the capital city, and I think that's often forgotten, uh, the capital city of our province, uh, but as you say, uh, the jewel uh, of our city for people. You just need to walk around the harbor right now in particular uh, to see the number of of uh, visitors who are just in awe of the fact that right in the center of our town, we have this incredible asset. Um, so yes to phase uh, two finishing up and phase three getting going, we need that terminal there. Uh, I'd like to see the docks finally being put in place, uh, but when tourists come in, we need to make sure that we've got a, a great welcoming place for them, and we don't right now. Atco trailers don't do it, <laughs> and we aren't able to deal with the security issues um, as well that are a challenge. Uh, as security has changed, we've had to make some adjustments there as well. I think the public access uh, opportunity is going to be really exciting in, in phase two, the partnership with First Nations as well, uh, being involved in that area. So I think we're, we're well on our way and we'll be well positioned with the capital fund to be able to uh, put a request forward for phase three and I'm happy and, and we'll be pleased to advocate for that issue as well. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Uh, I first came to Victoria in 2003 to attend UVic, and uh, as a mature student, 24 years old, I was uh, looking for a job in town, and I ended up uh, across the water from the terminal at Milestones. Uh, and so I, uh, I, I owe in part uh, my education absolutely to the existence of that terminal. Uh, you know, that when people came in and came straight across the water to, to sit down and have a, a drink on the patio, it was uh, it ended up being very lucrative, especially since. The dollar at the time was, I think, 63 or 67 cents on the dollar. <laughs> they tipped well, so that's what I'm saying. Um, but yeah, absolutely, this, uh, this, this, the terminal has to be uh, a priority for us it, for so many reasons, uh, as Carol has elaborated. Um, economic reasons, uh, but the pride in the city too, the fact that you know, we, we look down there and it, it, it does look like it, it's something out of a, a you know, movie set because you know, everything is just kind of slapped together. Uh, and we need, we definitely need, I mean, like, there are so many iconic buildings down there. There's the, the legislature, the, the Empress, and um, even the steamship terminal now. We need, uh, we need some kind of crowning achievement there, you know. Um, and so, yeah, absolutely, uh, should I be elected, I would support you in, uh, in, in ensuring the end of phase two and the, and the completion of phase three as well. Um, and uh, I'm really looking forward to the, the ability to uh, bring everybody together. Um, I think, uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, I, I run my coffee shop is because I like talking to as many people as possible towards a, a common goal, and that's, um, I think that's what uh, what's probably needed here, um, and I think that will help us over the hurdle and, and, and get us into the finish line of having uh, a wonderful world-class harbor. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have the issue of developing Ogden Point in establishing Home Port Victoria, presented by Ian Robinson of the Greater Victoria Harbor Authority. Ian, you have two minutes. Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, thank you uh, to both of you. Actually, to both of you and all the candidates out there, thanks for your commitment to uh, public service. It's a, a tireless job and it's much appreciated. Uh, expansion and development of the Marine Terminal at Ogden Point has the potential to be the largest economic uh, revitalization project in decades for Victoria, uh, managed by uh, GBHA. Ogden Point is home to Canada's busiest uh, cruise ship port of call. Uh, this year will welcome more than 550,000 passengers and more than 200,000 crew. 
on 220 ships. Uh, the cruise industry is estimated to have a significant economic benefit, uh, totaling over $130 million annually to Greater Victoria. In addition, 90% uh, of the guests say they'll return. So, uh, as Paul likes to say, it's a, a, a large uh, a fam trip that comes to Victoria. Uh, to sustainably build and manage uh, future growth in cruise and other uh, essential marine industries, uh, the Harbour Authority has developed the Ogden Point Master Plan, which is near completion. Uh, it's focusing on uh, partnerships with First Nations, Songhees Nation, and the Squamal Nation, and uh, will uh, provide a strong cultural presence on the site, at community-based uh, uh, retail service and hospitality infrastructure, and uh, it includes an attractive investment and uh, development potential for marine industries, uh, building on the site's long history as a viable working harbour. Uh, we're close to completion on the master plan. Our ask of the of the provincial government uh, should uh, should either of your party uh, take uh, take office is uh, for first of all for support and completion of the Ogden Point Master Plan and secondly um, uh, to support our application uh, to the federal government to under the Building Canada Fund to financially assist with the construction of a new cruise terminal. So we're asking uh, to a support the master plan and secondly support our application uh, for federal funding. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Let's start with Callum and then we can break. Thank you, um, Yeah, this is another one of those situations where it is a tremendous boom to the region uh, to have uh, a, uh, a, uh, a facility like this in our backyard. Um, and I think uh, the home porting idea is, uh, is an interesting one, um, and I am supportive of it in, in principle. Um, again, I haven't really spoken much to uh, the BC Greens uh, about a, a party principle, uh, but I personally, I, I do support it uh, with um, one caveat. Um, I've, I've seen some of the, uh, the, the, the drawings for the, the, uh, the, 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 the Arctic Point uh, home port. Um, it is nice that it has uh, the incorporation of the First Nations people. Um, but uh, the neighbors in James Bay have been uh, have expressed on a number of occasions. I've been to a few meetings recently that have uh, they're, they're tremendously concerned about uh, about their neighborhood being uh, torn upside down. Um, so I would really put my my support contingent on making sure that we actually have a, a really robust and honest conversation about how we're going to facilitate or support the residents of James Bay in maintaining the character of their neighborhood while also allowing uh, the the Ogden Point to. to Benefit the rest of the region. Uh, again, again, uh, tons of tourists help fund it, fund my uh, my education. So I recognize how important it is. Um, but I would like to I would like to think that unlike the sewage debacle that's going on, where the Squamish got all the benefits, I think we need to be uh, addressing uh, James Bay's needs and uh, the development of this project as well. So, um, but otherwise, I'm looking forward to it. it looks like it's going to be an amazing project. Thank you, Tom. question uh, that it has the potential for, for great excitement uh, in our neighborhood as well, uh, in the community as well. You know, there are, there are, as you say, many benefits uh, to the cruise industry when it comes to tourism, when it comes to the economy, when it comes to small businesses in our community. Uh, there's also um, a real appreciation uh, of the cruise ships in the neighborhood. Uh, and you'll see people who go down to get their schedules of when the cruise ships come in, uh, because that's part of the excitement of, of living in a neighborhood with a working harbor. I grew up in James Bay, I continue to live in James Bay, and uh, you know, it was a working harbor when I was a kid growing up. We had the shipyards uh, down at Ogden Point, and that's a, a real strength from my perspective. Um, and what I certainly believe needs to happen, and, and the discussion needs to happen, is a, a real partnership with the Neighborhood Association and the Harbor Authority. Because in fact, if you take a look at some of the challenges, we've taken some steps, and you've taken some steps uh, as an authority to deal with issues like traffic. Uh, I live on the route where the cars and the taxis on the cruise ship bays uh, create some danger uh, in the community for the kind of speed that people are heading down to pick up passengers. So the green bus was a great initiative. Uh, I'm really pleased that we we're able to move in it. I think we have to continue to talk about shore power and other uh, issues to see if we can 
uh, both deal with the climate issues but the impact on the community when it comes to emissions as well. Um, so I think there are lots of specifics that can be worked on and I hope that there will be a real partnership there between the neighborhood association and the authority so that we can actually address those issues. Um, good work has been done, I know, on the air quality monitoring as well, um, and that's another critical issue uh, that has to be dealt with. So it's not either or. Uh, I think the neighborhood, even the folks who are concerned, uh, recognize cruise ships are there, support them, but they want to make sure that it's done uh, in a way that the neighborhood is part of that solution as well. Thanks. Thank you, Carol. <laughs> Finally, Mayor Helps will talk about conveying sewage treatment. I believe no one's clapping for sewage treatment. <laughs> Very good. So um, this this paper was crafted before we uh, finalized plans and uh, and have shovels in the ground. So there are actually shovels in the ground now uh, on the McLaughlin Point Tertiary uh, Sewage Treatment Plant, and that's really good news. But we're still going to need, as a region, the support of the province moving forward on next steps because there are some next steps. And here are the three things that we request. Uh, and, um, and would love for your input on these. So the first is to support the region in the implementation of this project by positively and proactively addressing any challenges that arise. There may be some, we don't know what they are. We've got a fantastic team on it, but we will need to look to the province for leadership uh, on this uh, and really just positive and solutions oriented in terms of the construction. Uh, number two, and this is really important, and this is probably where the bulk of the work is going to be, um, if required, amend legislation with regard to the management of liquid and solid waste to allow for waste integration and beneficial use of waste to energy uh, and also look to fund pilot projects in this regard. Um, this is a problem across British Columbia and there's been uh, indications that this region could be a real leader in solving the problem. So right now Metro Vancouver is shipping their biosolids uh, out to the Nicola Valley. Well that's great for Metro Vancouver but Nicola Valley doesn't like it very much. So we need to create an in situ way to treat waste, uh, well we're treating the waste but to treat the byproducts of sewage treatment and to create a positive closed loop energy system. Uh, we can do that here, we're working on it at the CRD but we're really, this is going to be the biggest ask on this issue for the province. We really need the province to come to the table to look for flexibility and innovation. Uh, and then the third piece is related to that to provide a share pick fair share of provincial funding for any pilot projects, again, recognizing that they'll benefit not only this region, but the province as a whole. So I guess my question is, what do you think of that, and can you commit to that? Thanks. Thank you. Let's start with uh, MVP Carol Jenks. Well, it wouldn't be another election in Victoria without a discussion around sewage. Uh, I needed to say that first, because I think that I've certainly been involved in a number of elections. It's always been a discussion uh, every election. Uh, so I look forward to an election when we come up and it's actually completed yeah. and we have it finished in our region. <laughs> election four years from now we're talking about how successful the project is and how we can uh, how we can complete it um, I agree on the waste issue I think that so yes move ahead yes the leadership uh, to make sure that we get it done I think there are mitigation issues that still have to be addressed and you certainly have heard it I'm sure uh, as all of us have from the communities of James Bay in particular some Fairfield issues but James Bay in particular around noise and odor um, and I would hope that those discussions will continue because I think there is a genuine desire to address those and mitigate those uh, in the community. It's not an anti-sewage argument at all that we're hearing. It is people who recognize that we need to get on with it, that it needs to be done in a way that recognizes the impact on the community itself. Uh, and so I think that needs to be addressed. Um, on the waste issue, you're quite right. This is not, it's not a unique issue to Victoria or to our sewage treatment. This has been a dump issue. Uh, and a problem in our province and we need to, to get on with it. So we have talked as well about energy, uh, alternative energy options uh, and some ideas for pilots so it would be a perfect opportunity so I'm happy to, to advocate uh, on that behalf to, to get the project moving. Um, I think piloting is an interesting approach to, to go um, so that we can look at some solutions that won't be unique simply to Victoria but will be able to be used around the province. Um, to address the issues that are, are causing problems in communities. So I look forward to those discussions. I look forward to actually getting it done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, this is, uh, I, I've been recently uh, engaged with it. Of course, I, I haven't been uh, in as many elections as Carol. In fact, this is my first one. Uh, but uh, this has definitely uh, been an issue that uh, has been very much top of mind since, um, well, for me, for about a year and a half, I've been going to these various meetings from, uh, you know, the, the, the Crystal Gardens, or Crystal Pool, rather, or yeah, Crystal Gardens around the corner, or, um, many in James Bay. And, uh, Carol raises a, a couple of good points uh, with regards to odor and noise uh, for the uh, for the treatment plant. Um, I too am also concerned about uh, what um, what happens with the, the raw sewage afterward or the uh, I guess the, the solids afterwards. Um, I had an interesting conversation with a gentleman uh, the other day about um, gasification um, and uh, the potential and the viability of um, of actually using our compost waste. Because my understanding is that we're shipping that. To the lower mainland, is that, that, is that right? Um, yeah, so shipping all of our biocells to the mainland is uh, ridiculous, and we know that the, uh, um, the, uh, the, the, the Heartland landfill will run out of space if we're not careful. Um, and so the BC Greens are very much focused on uh, in employing new technologies to solve current problems. Um, we believe very much in uh, investing in our, our technical colleges and our universities to find solutions. Um, you know, we talked about exporting these uh, ideas and these solutions to the rest of the province, but what about the rest of the world? Um, we know that there are uh, technologies like this that exist in, uh, in Sweden and Norway and things like this that um, do have that closed loop element. Um, how cool would it be for our green buses to be powered by our own waste? I mean, that's, there's some really innovative thinking that has been done elsewhere and it would be really nice to be able to just drag and drop this into, into place here so that we can actually get ahead of this. And, uh, and, and actually uh, derive some value from what has typically been uh, a waste product. Thank you, Bob. Thanks, everyone, for the fast-paced uh, discussion and for the party's response. Now we have 20 minutes for questions from the audience to our two candidates here. In order to allow as many questions as possible, please set up to the mics you see on the floor, there's three of them. Introduce yourself and also make your questions brief and to the point. I'll stop you at one minute. Please indicate if your question is to both the candidates or just to one. So, are there any questions from the floor? My understanding was that all the parties would have an opportunity to speak, but now you're saying it's just the two up there. Sorry, what we'll do is we'll bring the mic down to you. Um, I think there's a uh, handheld mic. I thought we were going to do public questions from the mic and then the one minute's from each correct. of the candidates. That's correct. Right. So these are not from the candidates already. So we're going to do one they from. Can be two of the candidates. Yeah. A question and answer session to these. Uh, these candidates on stage. Yeah. Is that clear? So as a libertarian representative, I won't be able to answer questions. Sir. No, you're no. one minute statement. So, can you please uh, go to the mic, since that's the mic that's got the lineup. If anybody wants mm -hmm. to go to these other two mics, please do so. And please address the candidates and which one you want to respond from. Okay, well, I'd like to respond from both. Uh, online on uh, Facebook, one of the things I've noticed is that the conversation is basically being about vote splitting in strategic voting. And of course, with our electoral system, it's whoever gets past the finish line first wins the game. So, with a proportional system, the vote splitting and the strategic uh, voting is not as prevalent as it is because with a first past the post system, you don't get a check and second chance. And if you don't win, then your voice is not in the legislature. Does your party support a proportional? representation system, and if so, how would you implement it? Thank you. From the Green Party, yes. Uh, that's an excellent question, and uh, I would introduce you to our platform. Uh, that pretty much talks about this uh, very much in depth. Um, yeah, we absolutely support uh, electoral reform. Uh, we would do it for the next election. Uh, we would not hedge with uh, any committees that want that's Great, that's not true. I'm, I'm speaking out of turn. I want us to move right ahead with it, implement STB, and, uh, and then have a referendum eight years down the road. 
Um, I think the party wants to take some time and, and actually address uh, the issue um, with, uh, with British Columbians writ large. Um, and I, you know, I, I appreciate that. Thankfully, in this riding, um, we don't have to worry about vote splitting. Clearly, there's only two of us uh, up here. Uh, <laughs> so, there's a, uh, are you going to split one of our votes? <laughs> oh, exactly. You're trying, okay, fair enough. Um, I, don't, I don't see it as a, an issue uh, of, of its, uh, vote splitting in this, in this riding. I feel like we've got two very strong uh, candidates here and uh, on the stage at the moment. We have also more others down here. Um, but I think for the progressive option, the uh, anti-liberal vote, if you want to go there, um, we do have uh, two very good choices, and I think you should vote your conscience. Thank you, Colin. Carol? Um, yes to electoral reform. Uh, you know, I, I've sat in the legislature, I ran in the beginning uh, as leader of our party to do politics differently, uh, and I truly believe that the way we're really going to make a shift in the system is to change the system. Um, I really believe that that's the approach we need to take and the electoral reform, our plan is to in the second year bring in a referendum uh, that would be 50% plus one, uh, no super majority as the BC Liberals had, had tried to do to have it defeated. Um, we would actively support the referendum, we would not take a neutral position, we would take a positive position um, and we believe the public is ready. It would have passed last time if we'd been a 50% plus one. So I think electoral reform is critical, I think we have to move in it, we have to ban big money from politics, um, union and corporate donations as well. And then we also have to open up the electro electoral system, the legislature, with committee structures. The federal government does some amazing work, federal level, not the political government. Uh, the federal level does amazing work with select standing committees at the federal level that travel the country, that have members from different parts of, uh, of the legislative and political system. We need to be looking at that at the legislature as well to open up the democratic process uh, to more voices, which can only be strong. Thank you, Carol. Thank you very much. We'll go there and then we'll go there after, so if you're on for a minute. Okay, thank you. Uh, say, hey, how's everyone doing today? Right Is it addressed to the two candidates? Absolutely, please? yes, please, absolutely. Uh, NDP candidate, Green candidate, thank you. Oh, liberal candidate. Oh, we can see right through you, okay. <laughs> this question, and um, I've heard a lot about answers or providing solutions within the system but have either of your candidates taken a look at our capitalist system, capitalistic system, and seen any flaws in that? If not, I have in my hand a vaccine for poverty. It was a solution, but it's a vaccine for poverty, actually. So no one has to go poor anymore, and I wish to give it to you to take a look at, please. Thank you. <laughs> we'll go to the middle mic there. Yes, my, my question is, um, how do you deal with offering more services to adults so that when they reach 18, or some go longer than that, but when they reach the age of the cutoff of the service, they don't wind up falling right off and having way lesser than they did when they were in a child with their families, and they can continue to move to the next phase of their life and others who never got the service as a kid then can get it at an adult so they don't miss it because they just didn't get diagnosed or whatever, whatever, whatever they had as a child. Thank you. Sure. Um, thank you and thank you for asking the question. Uh, it's one of the areas um, that is most troubling to me uh, under the, the BC Liberals and the approach that they've taken. Um, they have made it more difficult for people to transition at age 19, particularly if they've been diagnosed and then move into the uh, CLBC system, um, the Community Living BC system, which is where people with disabilities uh, and, and developmental disabilities move into. Uh, the government, for some reason, decided that uh, your services and supports would be cut when you turn 19 instead of continuing on. So we have people who move into situations with very little support when they turn 19, who are put into home share individual um, services without the supports that they need that they received before when they were uh, before they were 19. So uh, we need a seamless system that provides support for people. But I think the other issue, and we've had this conversation as well, uh, are the challenges for people who are diagnosed later in life. 
um, who have not been in any system and get a diagnosis of autism or otherwise later in life, they need supports, they need services, and we're committed to making sure that that occurs. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, this is uh, absolutely a, a key uh, issue. Is um, I, I hate the distinction between uh, you know youth and adult um, because it's not it doesn't actually serve any purpose, especially in cases of uh, of service providers. Right? If you are in need, you are in need. If you're 12 or 24 or 36 or 86, uh, if you are in need, our community needs to come together and serve uh, those people, support those people. Um, so BC Greens have committed to uh, to supporting um, people in need uh, across the board. Um, I'm blanking on all the numbers right now, but it's uh, the the whole premise. And actually, Marte just raised the issue of uh, of, of solving poverty is is that our system is, is, is worried about money as opposed to outcomes. And uh, I propose to you that, that we should be looking at, at actually supporting individuals rather than, uh, rather than worrying about the dollars and cents of money. Thank you, Tom. Can you go there? Can you please introduce yourself first? Thank you. Hi, I'm Patrice Hammond. I'm a nurse. And I'm here on behalf of the Nurses Union. And, um, my question is in regards to safe patient care and also keeping our nurses safe. There's a lot of violent incidents against nurses, nursing burnout, and hallway patient care. We need more nurses, we need more specialized education for nurses to be made available. So if you're elected, I would like to know how you would enable uh, nurses to provide more safe patient care. Ooh. Well, without a, an in depth, I mean, I, uh, without an in depth knowledge of, of the, the health system, I uh, say from the outside and, the, and the, from a coffee shop, um, I will, I'll tell you that what the BC Greens have offered or are proposing is that we need to invest in a wholly different way to look at healthcare. Um, we're talking about investing heavily in preventative care so that uh, you have less burden in the, the very beginning. We'll uh, establish a ministry of preventative health uh, as well. Um, and then, uh, Supporting uh, supporting nurses and doctors and everybody in the health, in the health system on the acute level by increasing funding there and, uh, and spreading out the burden um, where there's uh, long term uh, care needs we will invest in long term long term care a bit so that you're not doing triple duty while you're while you're on the ward. Um, I mean we all know how uh, how terrible it can be when there's a micro uh, crisis flu uh, you know that, that all of a sudden everybody's in hallways. Um, and that's mismanagement to uh, the nth degree, and uh, I can guarantee you that the BC Greens are uh, going to look for systemic solutions so that uh, we get more nurses, more doctors, uh, better healthcare facilities uh, that, uh, that support nurses. Uh, and of course, the other part of this too is the mental health of, of, uh, of, of first, group, first uh, line workers. Um, I myself was a youth care worker and worked in outreach, and I definitely needed counseling from time to time dealing with, uh, with difficult uh, cases. And um, nurses need to feel nurse, uh, feel supported in, in their in their work, so that we maintain the ones that we've trained and, and have a tremendous experience with. Thank you, Tom. First off, a huge thank you uh, to you and your members for the work that you do. Uh, the entire system is under pressure, and I think you've described it well. Whether it's nurses, whether it's doctors, whether it's healthcare workers, uh, whether it's patients, uh, people are feeling stretched in the system. Uh, I think the seniors' advocate report said everything when it said that over 90% of the facilities, long-term care facilities, on Vancouver Island don't meet the basic standards of care for residents because they don't have enough staff. So the first piece begins with staff and support for staff and facilities. The second piece is to look at primary health care teams with nurses and nurse practitioners and doctors and pharmacists. So we have an opportunity to be able to truly provide a quality team. The other piece is dealing with mental health and addictions issues because if the emergency room is the only place that is a source of support for individuals, which we see right now, then you see the kind of crisis uh, that happens. Uh, you know, I sat in the emergency room with a family member a few months ago and watched as a homeless individual came out after some treatment and was told he had to leave uh, to go to a shelter and he wasn't able to walk. Well, he got angry. That caused a, an incident. Those are the kinds of things that we need to deal with by having the supports 
in place in urgent care centres so we can take the pressure off and provide support to the staff on the front line. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, I'll just uh, give your name and then uh, ask your question if it's to both candidates or one. Yeah, so this will be to both candidates. My name is Adam McLean, the Libertarian Party candidate for Senate South. I'd like to know how both of you feel that uh, about the situation that other candidates from other parties have effectively been denied a voice at this forum, which is a very important aspect of our democratic process. At the beginning, we're told we get to answer questions, and now we're told we get a one-minute statement at the end. How do you feel about this denial of the democratic process to all voices by the state in this election? Thank you. There's no question there was some confusion uh, about how the structure was going to happen tonight. Uh, and I think that's unfortunate because I think the expectations were there for, for candidates who came uh, and thought they'd have more of an opportunity to speak. So I think that's unfortunate. Um, I stand with you, man. Uh, electoral reform is uh, all about including diversity of voices. And um, I mean, like, if you want to come up here, take my spot. I'm happy to give you. No, I'd love to. I would love to take the spot. No, no I, but like, I, I'm in charge of this mic. So if you want, if you want it, uh, I I think I will uh, say no. <laughs> I mean, the, the, we, he, makes, he makes a good point, though, right? He does make a good point, and when I started my statement, I did say that the candidates from the audience will get a minute to address. Right, but if we're having a conversation about democracy, then it's uh, and and these people have done all of the work to the candidates. Uh, and they will be on the ballot. It, it seems a little bit disingenuous that we're standing up here talking about the people who are going to serve. Uh, when we made this, when, when we had this forum and we had actually decided which way we were going to do, the five organizations had decided that we were going to elect and have the candidates that actually have a seat at the legislature. That's prejudging the, the, the outcome of the, the election, but. Boo. I'll take a question from there. Thank you. My name is Theodore, and my question is for the Green candidate. It's the morning after the election, you wake up to find out that the Green and the NDP have split the vote on the left, and you have re-elected Christy Clark <laughs> that stands against everything that you stand for. When you look yourself in the mirror, how would you feel? What would you say? Why not form a coalition as of now, defeat corporate Christie, and uh, promise us electoral reform and proportional representation? Well, th thank you for the question. Um, in this, the way our system works is that we have the opportunity to elect uh, one member of the representative. Rep representative. And um, clearly up here you have two, and we've just, just addressed the issue that there are more uh, available. But um, I think in this writing, I've very much believe that in this writing we have two very progressive choices that one of which will win. Um, so I don't actually have any culpability in the outcome of the election. The British Columbians do get to choose to vote for whom they feel is best uh, suited to support them. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree with you. Uh, Christy Clark has not been uh, our best premier. Uh, I think, though, that the democratic process is worth uh, going through with. And there's a significant amount of difference between the BC Greens and the BC NDP that I don't think the coalition is wise. And third of all, there are a number of British Columbians who have not been inspired by either the Liberals or the NDP. And so giving them the third option is the only way that we engage them and allow democracy to work. Based. It's not right now because we don't have enough people on the ground. Uh, I believe that the science was there, which showed that it's not going to address the issue of the caribou and the challenges uh, faced by the caribou. Um, so we believe it has to be science and fact based, and that means more boots on the ground, more people on, uh, who are able to give that information, and we've got a commitment in our platform to do that so we can address the real issues that need to be addressed. They're not being addressed by simple a simple call of one species or another. Thank you. I agree. Uh, the uh, 
the, the ban of the grizzly bear that has to has to has to come in place and um, grizzly bears are an endangered species so it's like the fact that there is anything remotely resembling a, a, a trophy uh, hunt is or a grizzly bear hunt is ridiculous um, as far as the the the, the, uh, the wolves issue uh, my understanding again is that it is a larger ecosystem issue the fact that human human encroachment has been a, a real problem into their territory um, evidence-based uh, decision making is kind of the only way that I see forward um, and uh, I, yeah that's, that's the best I can do for you I, I don't support the, the slaughter of, of, of wolves I think it's uh, it, it, we as a community have to decide what's best for for our communities and um, I would Jordan's going to have a lot to say about that in his next minute so uh, I want to speak over thank you John we'll go to the farm right over here First, I'd like to thank uh, both the candidates on the stage and off for being here, as well as for the organizers for putting this on. Uh, I think being for electoral reform is good and all, and being against uh, money politics, good. But it doesn't go, I think, deep enough into some of the other issues, like hyper-partisanship and the things that keep parties from being able to give credit where credit is due. It doesn't, for instance, go after why politicians and political parties often prove themselves to be hypocrites when they suddenly hold the power. So what are we going to do about civic education? Because civic education is what creates citizens. It's what makes citizens out of voters, simply. Voters are consumers. Citizens are actually engaged, uh, engaged in, in the system in an even deeper level. It sets the lowest common denominator for our society. And if we believe that politicians are a reflection of the voters, we need better voters. What are the political parties going to do to create better voters and citizens? Well, I'm, I'm proud to be a, a member of the party that is actually committing real dollars to education. Um, $250 million above what the courts have, have ordered the Liberals uh, to, uh, to invest in education. Um, that, Starts, that, that starts there and ramps up so that over the course of the four-year mandate, we're investing over $4.4 million billion dollars in, uh, in education. And you're absolutely right. The future of, uh, of our society is hinges on the success of our youth. And <clears throat> before I got into, into actual politics, um, I was working with a, a coalition of, uh, of academics and, um, and community activists uh, from across the Lower Mainland and, and uh, in uh, Southern Ireland. Um, who were uh, looking to build in uh, modules, training modules, into every single subject where government meets subject X. So if the biology, uh, when you're studying biology, you know that there's biology, or there's, uh, there's grants, that come, science grants come from the government. So that people know, or kids know, and when they graduate, that they know that they have an interaction with uh, their, uh, their government that, that goes beyond the top-down approach. So you're absolutely right, the citizens uh, are have to be educated and ready to, to, to actually act, uh, participate in our democracy. Um, and you're absolutely right, I, I do believe that uh, the partisanship and the, the big money and all these other things in government are uh, the, one of the biggest problems. Thank you, Carol. Well, I, I think uh, as someone who attended a, a number of schools over this last while, that's one of the things I do as an MLA. I think it's important to go up to schools, elementary, secondary, middle schools, and talk to students about, uh, about politics and democracy, most importantly. Um, I actually am optimistic about the next generation coming up, I have to tell you. Um, we had a, a debate at Central Middle School, which was extraordinary. The questions, the thoughtful debate. The discussion that the students were having. George J. School, the students provided uh, a question and answer session as well. Um, so I'm feeling very optimistic about the upcoming generation because I have to be honest, I think young people will not put up um, with the existing system. I think they will expect it to be changed and they will be part of that and they will be active in that. Um, so I agree that schools have a huge role to play um, when it comes to curriculum and making sure that uh, being a good citizen is part of the curriculum. We've had um, that happen over the years. In my years in education, I was a school trustee for 10 years, and there was um, volunteer work that came forward as part of a, a student's um, um, graduation requirements. So I think there are lots of good ideas. We don't need to reinvent the wheel, um, but I think the students are demanding it. The school system has to adapt, and the political system for sure has to adapt. Thank you, Carol. Go ahead, please. Um, 
My name is Joan, and my question is for both candidates. And I did ask you this question at the last meeting, but I'd like to ask you again just for the benefit of the audience. Um, in 2015, um, the Parliamentary Subcommittee on Human Rights passed a motion condemning China for the killing of Falun Gong prisoners of conscience in order to harvest their organs and sell them for profit. And uh, people from around the world, including BC, go to China for a new organ because you, you can get one there in a couple of weeks and they're desperate for an organ and if they can afford it, they go there. Uh, but they don't know that people are being killed for those organs. And my question is, uh, what can the, the provincial government do to protect BC patients from the risks of uh, organ, organ, uh, uh, um, organ um, trafficking? Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, thank you to all of you for your advocacy. Uh, you've come out to all candidates' meetings, you've raised the issue, you're providing information to the candidates, and I think that's the first step is basic education so that the people in the system know uh, the information and can take a look at it and can make sure that they can, can put a plan together, whether it's education for people uh, going overseas or whether it's talking with the federal government around the, the human rights issue, which is, as you have noticed and have said, is a, a federal government issue. Um, just on the human rights, I, I just want to mention a, a piece around human rights. We are the only province uh, that doesn't have a human rights commission. Um, every other province has one. The BC Liberals had it. Um, we have committed to bring it back. Um, making sure that uh, at every possible opportunity when we are dealing with uh, patients who are in need of, uh, of an organ transplant, that they know uh, the dangers um, and, uh, and the crisis that is being uh, experienced in, uh, in China. So um, I think that's, that's the best that we can do is, again, from, I'm, not, I'm an outsider I'm coming into politics, so, um, but I think advocacy and education are gonna be the two big things that for the Ministry of, Ministry of Health and, uh, do um, educating doctors as well, so that like that there is really no stone left unturned. Thank you, Captain. 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 Please uh, put your hand up. Uh, Catherine will bring the mic to you. Thank you. You can, you, 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 yeah, you can just uh, pass this uh, mic after you're done with a one minute presentation, please. 60 seconds, I'm gonna read this quickly. My name's Richard Patty, I'm signing South. I have been, I'm on two boards right now. I've been a senior administrator at college. I've volunteered at Sandwich for 20 years. Uh, I'm the director of Sandwich Search and Rescue. Mayor Helps, easy answer, guaranteed annual minimum income, index to the cost of the region you're in. Mental health care, there are three, three childhood psychiatry uh, professionals in the region. The system is there, Carol. BHA needs to be reprioritized, reorganized, and financed properly. Catherine, LRT, more buses at peak times. The Liberals are shortchanging us $750 million over the next three years of the budget. We could easily afford light rail transit from Souk to Sydney. Um, no more commissions. We've had enough talking. Let's get this done. Uh, if you're from Sandwich, please vote for me. Thank you. Thank you. The single greatest challenge for small parties in any election is consistently being ignored by the media and in some cases organizers of events which means we have to work that much harder to get your attention and to earn your votes. We're working hard out there, guys. We're working to bring a message that's diversely and dramatically different than the other parties who have consistently pitched the same solutions to the problems, election after election after election. It's time to stop ignoring the sm smaller parties. It's time to start taking a look at them and seeing what they stand for. Because hearing the same old solutions all the time, it's getting us nowhere. It's not working. Our platform is at libertarians.bc.ca. Check it out. I'm in San itself. I hope to have your vote. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Jordan Reichert. I'm an independent in Victoria Beacon Hill, and uh, people usually refer to me as the animal candidate. Uh, in many cases, I'm also the environmental candidate and the social justice candidate because I take a position that would be deeper green than the Green Party on most issues because I include animals in my policy. So if we talk about things like animal agriculture, uh, like climate change, I make sure I talk about things like animal agriculture and it being one of the most devastating parts of, uh, for to the environment, to our oceans, and to our societies. It injures our health, it injures our well-being, and yet we're not talking about it. Why? Because animals are still commodified and treated as property. So, what do I bring? Well, I bring you an opportunity to make history, not just change that the other parties offer you. A history is the opportunity to elect the first representative that includes animals in their policy to the legislature. That is a rare opportunity, something that we should take with a uh, great deal of uh, reflection. Because right now, there are hundreds of millions of animals being killed in BC each year, and they have zero representation. Think about that when you go home to your pets. Think about that when you see birds, when you appreciate orcas, okay? When you look at what's on your plate. Your right. time is coming to an end. Thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. My name is Mitzi Dean. I'm the BC NDP candidate for Why Not Be Chosen. I'm really, really proud to take that on. I've been serving our community for over 10 years. I've been the Executive Director of Pacific Centre Family Services Association. We serve about 1,600 people a year, and every day I see people walking through my door, and they're struggling with their needs that are getting more complex, and they're struggling to get by. They're working really hard on behalf of their families, and they're not able to get by paycheck to paycheck. And I know that they're really trying to do their best and that it's actually because of the 16 years of the BC Liberals policies that's putting them into that position. And so I'm really proud to step up for the first time as a candidate uh, uh, on behalf of the BC NDP and I'm very, very proud of our platform. Our platform is extremely comprehensive. And when I'm out on the doorstep and I hear what the major issues are for people, I know that our plans are based on evidence and very thought through proposals and will meet the immediate needs of people in my community. They're really concerned about affordability. That's a really critical issue. People are choosing between buying groceries or paying for hydro. People really need services put back. Services have been cut, agencies have fallen to the wayside and we have too many and too long wait lists. And we need to revitalize the economy. We need jobs that are family supporting and that are based in communities. The BC NDP will deliver that. We will deliver a better BC. Thank you. Thank you. If I may, we hear about the uh, vaccine for poverty. We'll have that. We have $2 billion net profit. $1.3 billion for the Water Corporation, another billion dollar net profit, so that much stresses, from the Liquor Board. We should use that money to actually solve the problems instead of putting a band-aid solution that, come off, that comes off every three or four years and used for election rhetoric. If you had a basic level of income that was accountable, giving an extra $25 a day, would you take it? I offer a solution. And I, I hope that the candidates will adopt this. Also, uh, sorry, Delmar Marte, as final the chosen independent candidate. I am pledging 50% of my income to go to a contingency fund. So when the government, when the government fails to act, we can in the lace. And I wish to propose that now to the candidates here. Would you give donate 50% of your income? Would you, by a chance, give 50% of your income to a contingency fund? So when the government fails to act, like opioid crisis, you'd be able to help. Thank you, your time. Yes. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Do we have any other candidates? I see Barb from the Liberal Party has joined us. Uh, Barb, would you like to make a minute's statement? And is there perfect? Um, 
Are you by the mic? Did you want to do that? Oh, sure. And then we'll take the mic to Barb. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Brendan Ross. I'm the BC Green Party candidate for the Langford One Fuqua Right. And I just wanted to thank all the hosts that are displayed on the screen tonight, as well as all the engaged voters and candidates for coming out. Uh, Kaylin spoke enably to many of the issues that were posed uh, tonight, but uh, on the doorstep in Langford One Fuqua, two that have come up most frequently uh, for the voters there, I found, have been housing and transportation. So I just wanted to quickly add a few points that. Uh, Housing, I'm very proud that the BC Green Party has taken a very clear stand that uh, the primary purpose of housing in BC and any government involvement in that industry should be to provide homes for British Columbians, not to provide a speculative real estate get-rich-quick market. And as far as transportation, our platform is built around affordability, sustainability, and efficiency. Specifically, you can imagine like for going to Fuca, transportation is a very strong issue. I absolutely support dedicated bus lanes as well as exploring the full suite of other options, including LRT, uh, marine options, HOV lanes, any other solutions to, to get people out of their cars and make the movement of people and goods more fluid in our region. I'll wrap up by encouraging you to please check out our uh, platform at bcgreens.ca and uh, thank you all for coming out this evening to hear us. BC Greens, change you can count on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is this on? Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much and I apologize for being late. We had a uh, rally earlier and uh, the other candidates send their best wishes. Uh, I was the one that got to have my car right outside the front door so that I could get here fast enough to be able to speak. BC Liberals have uh, really taken to heart what uh, you put forward uh, in the first uh, session and uh, in have included many of your uh, requests into our Vancouver Island platform. I uh, uh, ask that you all go to the BC Liberal pl Island platform take a look. We have uh, looked at uh, and heard that transportation, certainly in my writing, is absolutely transit and transportation is number one. People, anybody who's traveling from the West Shore uh, downtown uh, is seeing that the gridlock is no longer acceptable. It's interesting, I landed on doorsteps of people who moved here from Vancouver thinking that they were going to get away from gridlock and they have seen an increase in it over the last number of years. We have in our platform put forward that we will uh, put money toward uh, the Malahat for safety. These uh, changes that will occur will occur uh, in consultation with communities that know uh, the areas best to deal with and put in priority. We have also uh, put together uh, a, a platform that includes uh, helping uh, Harbor Authority home port two ships uh, by 2021 uh, and uh, that's exciting uh, for the region in terms of economy. That is huge. Uh, we have talked about to the ENN rail corridor and uh, we have a plan uh, that uh, is we have to get something on that corridor, commuter service on the ENN corridor. Oh, thank you. Sorry. I wasn't aware of the time. Thank you. Yeah, there's a minute. I gave you a little more than that. Appreciate it. Do we have any more candidates? Do you have one minute? Just to say hi. <laughs> Are you. Uh, any more candidates out there? Oh, okay. Hi, I'm Karen Bill. I'm uh, the BC Liberal candidate here in Victoria Beacon Hill. Unfortunately, even though the BC Tech strategy is uh, definitely working here in Victoria, we have 23,000 people working here uh, in the tech industry, 884 businesses. They haven't figured out how to clone me yet. So, uh, my apologies for rushing in late. Um, as far as Victoria goes, we are seeing it thrive whether it be tech, whether it be tourism, whether it be agri-foods. And I'm really excited to see it thrive. Uh, you can see all of the uh, various developments that are going on. In James Bay, for instance, I think I just heard uh, Barb talk about Ogden Point. Um, that is something that's in our BC Liberal Island platform. 
and we are the only party that has an island platform. So we're looking at Octave Point, we're looking at the Malahat, we're looking at uh, the exchange, uh, Admiral McKenzie exchange. We are looking at potentially asking voters about uh, the Commonwealth Games bid. We are looking to increase and keep the thriving economy here. Jobs are important. Time. Thank you. Do we have any other candidates? Thank you everybody for attending our candidates' response session. We covered a lot of important issues in a short period of time. I would like to thank Jocelyn for keeping track of the time. Jocelyn and the City of Victoria for providing this uh, nice facility. Thank you, Jocelyn. <laughs> On behalf of the City of Victoria, the Downtown Victoria Business Association, Tourism Victoria, Greater Victoria Harbour Authority, and the Chamber, we hope our efforts to raise these issues and ask for provincial assistance have been informative as you decide who to vote for. Most important of all, please vote on May 9th or at the advanced polling. Thank you and have a great evening.